Well, Good morning, everyone. It's actually Joanne starting <laughs> yes, it. Yes, sorry. It'll be along in a couple of minutes. Um, so I'm, it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar on labor adjustment and LBS. And we're just thrilled you're here on this snowy and cold Monday morning, all pretty much all across the province, I think. So speaking of the province, on our next slide, we talk about, uh, just want to briefly tell you who's online, because I know uh, we often wonder that when we're on webinars, so we like to tell people. Uh, the bulk of the bulk of the audience, about uh, over 60%, is from LBS agencies and then followed by uh, about 25% from employment service agencies and the rest are a combination of employment services and LBS. And it's great that we have people from all across the province on the webinar. The strongest uh, group of contingents is again from southwestern Ontario, closely followed by northern Ontario, uh, joining for the webinars and then a, a strong group from central as well and a few people from the east. So wherever you are, we we are delighted that you're here. So the slide decks for this presentation will be uh, emailed out to you right after the webinar and they'll come from the CLO at bellnet.email and Anne will uh, be happy to take questions at the end uh, but if you have burning questions during, please do put them in in text chat. We'd love to hear from you, either resources that you might have, your questions, or experiences that you might have in your community with labor adjustment and LBS. That, that would be very, uh, very welcome. So just a reminder that this webinar is being recorded, and in fact, all of the webinars in this series are, are recorded, and they'll be available uh, later in December on the following websites. So you can just go uh, uh, click there to get them. So without further ado, I am delighted to pass over the webinar to Anne Ramsey. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Joanne. Thanks, Vicki. I'm really pleased to be here to tell you about our um, project uh, and uh, our labor market partnership project and the focus that we had for our particular project during uh, 2013. Um, as you, just as a reminder, if this is the first webinar you're attending um, or if, if you've been sort of linking into the series, this is actually one of seven uh, projects by seven regional networks in uh, Western Region, which is of course the TCU, how TCU designates them, Western Region. And Western Region kind of ranges, if you're not familiar, from um, you know Niagara to Owen Sound, Collingwood, uh, over to Lake Huron, down to Sarnia, all the way down to Windsor, and sort of everywhere in between. And so Project Read, we um, focus on Waterloo, Wellington, so the Kitchener, Guelph, Cambridge area and Waterloo. Um, and um, uh, the overall goal of this uh, labor market partnership projects was to um, bring lower skilled and marginalized clients closer to employment. So we each looked at our own area to figure out sort of what particular strategy or strategies did we want to invest in. And um, for us, it was to take a look at the labor market adjustment situation. Um, I've been in literacy um, a long time. I started when I was six um, and it's been about 25 years. Um, so uh, we, we wanted, to, so I've been part of different labor adjustment sort of situations and sometimes literacy was included, sometimes not. Um, employment services has always been included. Um, uh, sometimes it was a very transparent process, sometimes a little too opaque or, or not transparent. Um, it just wasn't clear. And, and when I talked to colleagues, regardless of who they were, whether they were ES, LBS, or even other colleagues who aren't in EO, but other colleagues in the community, it just seemed like people, it, it depended on their experience with labor adjustment, what they knew about labor adjustment. And it didn't seem like we all had some sort of common thought about it. So we thought, okay, um, we were having a lot of, since 2008, at, at one point in, I believe it was 2009, 2010, in Project READ Literacy Network region alone, we had a dozen uh, action se centers going on. So a dozen co um, companies who had were having large enough um, layoffs that they had received funding to host a, a, an action center and usually that means they've got 50 or more employees 
because if you have 50 more employees, you have to report that to the government as a shutdown or a layoff, and um, then they're avail and then funds can be made available to help workers adjust uh, to the situation. Um, so it seemed like there was lots of different understandings of the process, and I thought, you know what, there's more shutdowns happening in our particular region. It was hastened by Maple Leaf, or if some of you may know it as Schneider's. This, there had been a plant in Air, Ontario, which is in our region, and also in Kitchener for a long, long time, decades and decades, and they were shutting down both operations, uh, amounting to about a thousand employees. So we thought, you know what, this is the time to take a look at labor adjustment. And we wanted to identify different supportive coordination strategies. What could we do as a regional network? And then what could we support the ES agencies and LBS agencies in our catchment area to do, you know, so anything to kind of smooth out and make the, the, the system, the process more effective. So we decided uh, as a methodology to do a bit of a, a literature review. Was there anything else going on out there? What were, what were the policies, if any, uh, that TCU was following? Um, because they, of course they have the AAP, which is their adjustment advisory uh, program. Uh, and uh, and we wanted to know more about that, so that was included in the literature review. We also did key informant interviews. I would say these were probably the most valuable piece in that our project consultant met with not only, as you can see, TCU staff, but a variety of EO um, employment, employment Ontario Employment Services providers, LBS, agencies as well. As you can see at the bottom, she was consulting on an ongoing basis with, with our local literacy service planning committees um, in all sectors, college, school board, community-based, the Waterloo Region Labor Council, um, laid off workers, workforce planning board, um, our local one, Waterloo Wellington Dufferin, and of course Action Centre staff because we've had Action Centres going on, you know, constantly since 2008 in our area. I think partly because in our particular area, um, we were traditionally a very um, industrialized uh, manufacturing base. Now there is still manufacturing, but it's moved to high tech manufacturing. We've got more biotechnology moving in. Um, we have lots of high tech in Waterloo region. Um, not only RIM, but there's uh, open text. Um, there's Google, there's Cisco, there's a lot of high-tech companies. Uh, the other sort of uh, rise in our area economically is food processing. And transportation and trucking is huge in our region as well, along with the education uh, sectors. So um, as I said before, there seemed to be this sort of lack of understanding of exactly how the adjustment process worked. It was all based on well, gee, when I did it before, this is how it worked. So it was very historical kind of knowledge and very inconsistent among all the providers. So we thought, you know, it would be good to have more clarity. But how do providers link into that? You know, is it open to any provider? And now I'm using provider in that widest sense of LBS, ES, you know, um, uh, any of those. And why is there, there used to be funding. People would apply historically if there was a shutdown, there would be sort of a, uh, a very brief mini needs assessment, sort of, you know, who, who's at that company, what's happening. If they could get demographics from the HR department, they would. Um, and there'd be an assessment of sort of, okay, what do they need? And then there'd be a call out, this is many years ago, to providers to say, you know, especially employment services, to say who can handle this, you know, what either individual provider or combination of provider can handle this. That had changed. So some agencies would get a call, some wouldn't. So again, we had some inconsistent understanding. There were different tools being used all the time in the initial screening and assessment. And in this case, we're talking about employment or employability type of assessments. Um, so a lot of the screening tools seemed to float around and again were historical. One agency might be using this thing. Now, I would say I've seen a lot of these things in the course of our investigation this year. A lot of the elements are the same. They were often asking, you know, there was demographics. Um, there was a little bit about, you know, do you have a job goal? What kind of work have you been doing? How about your education level? You know, last grade completed, last training you took, this type of thing. So it, 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 
the elements were very similar. Um, and what we found too is it depended on the workplace union and demographic profile, if it was available, that demographic profile, depended on all those factors, management union workers, all those factors as to how much initial screening or assessment of the workers went on. Because you, as you can imagine in a shutdown situation, if they're planning a complete shutdown of the factory, like it's going, it's closing its doors, um, the management would like workers to continue to work and that's understandable. So they wouldn't want to let them off the floor for very long to do any kind of screening. Conversely, the union may want their workers working and they but they want, of course, support. So they may want more time for screening, but they may be cautious about how is that information that's gained through the screening being used. And of course, is does the HR department have, in that particular company have a, a very um, comprehensive demographic profile? In other words, what are the last grade completed of the workers? What kind of range? Are there English as a second language issues? you know, the age of the workers, and that varies company to company. Sometimes the size of the company influences that. Small to medium enterprises, so may not have as much information because they may not have a very large HR department or anyone working as an HR person. That might be part of a plant manager's job. Conversely, in a large organization, uh, there may be a larger HR department that can give more information. Um, if they're doing a layoff, that's very sensitive as well because it's a layoff is usually consists of a group of, of a number of workers being laid off, usually permanently, not always. Sometimes there's a, a callback, you know, issue where you know you're being laid off for so many months and then you're called back to work. But in a lot of layoffs, it's a permanent layoff, but the factory or, or company is remaining. So it gets sensitive because it's about seniority and who who's being left and who's having to go. And, and if there is seniority, you know, I, I've, we've had workplaces where 20 years experience was um, the, um, it, it started at 20 years experience to even keep your job. So, um, you know, you can understand. And then there's the emotions around it. That plays a significant role. It's very much like almost like a bereavement process. So if any of you have been through this, you know what I'm talking about, the workers, it's, it's um, yeah, it, it's shocking to lose your job if you've been there many years or you figured I'd be there till I retire, you know, and we've seen a lot of that with some of the old, uh, old companies that have been in this region. And then, you know, how do they register clients if they're providing service, and I'm talking about employment services, how do they enter them in if they do into EOIS camps, and of course that's the employment Ontario information system, uh, case management um, system. Uh, how do you report? What reports are needed to give to TCU in a labor adjustment situation? And action centers, those aren't mandatory. Again, if there's 50 or more people being laid off at a single enterprise uh, or company, then they, can, they, they must notify um, the ministry, they must notify the government, and then they can apply and an action center is set up, if you're not familiar, an action center usually comes after the factory, after the layoff or the shutdown. It's sometimes located near or at that company. There are, there's a, 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 a committee put in place, the Labor Adjustment Committee, uh, made up of management union if it's present and workers. Uh, they manage the center, they hire a chair person who helps guide the process, usually an experienced chair from other, other action centers. Then they often employ a coordinator and peer helpers, and usually the peer helpers are drawn from the workforce that's being laid off because uh, they know the company, they can be supportive. Uh, so this action centers don't happen in each and every shutdown, but they are uh, often um, present in larger ones uh, where lots of people need to be adjusted or, or re placed into re-employment. So what's the literacy connection? Um, well certainly the employment services pro provides a, a client-centered supportive um, a service to um, workers and they're very much about including literacy in their client sessions and referring people to literacy services if that's deemed part of their employment plan. 
sometimes the challenge with that is workers say, I just want another job. I just, you know, help me find that next job and right away. They're, they're understandably panicked, worried, concerned, um, anywhere on that scale uh, about getting another job since they're losing their job. Uh, there's no particular screen for literacy issues that we could find in our area among the employability assessments. So sometimes I would see last grade completed, sometimes I would see explicit questions. Do you need any help with your writing? Do you need any help with your math? And, and as many of you know, sometimes asking questions in that kind of explicit manner, people are very reluctant to say yes, because it, in a way it's saying, yes, I can't read, I can't write, I can't do math. Um, so sometimes the, the questions were a, a, a bit, I'm going to try to say this nicely, a bit clumsy. Um, but certainly there was no consistency in the types or the range of questions asked about literacy. Uh, and I should say essential skills as well. Um, we needed a new way to, to talk about literacy. That came from the key informant interviews with employment services. They said, you know, I'd be more than happy to talk more about LBS options, but I'm not sure how to present it. It's sensitive. I don't think I'm telling any of you a secret by saying nobody likes the L word. Nobody likes the word literacy. It still unfortunately has negative connotations and says that, you know, maybe I don't know what I'm doing or I have no clue. Um, you know, I'm not intelligent. There's all these sort of concerns that come out when you say, or, you know, do you have literacy issues? Um, so it still can be quite um, stigmatizing. So, uh, and literacy training can take time depending on where somebody works. And oftentimes people want something, workers want something modular, like come in, get it, get going. There's this anxiousness and understandably they're going through a whole process of grieving their old job and trying to make their way in a new, new uh, labor force environment. So um, we talked about, and there was suggestions of having um, literacy providers at the initial worker meetings to plant the seeds of literacy and essential skills. And, and definitely we, when we go into a labor adjustment situation, Project READ often goes into them, and we often say things like, you know, essential skills, get your skills checked up. You know, we'll do a skills checkup with you. You know, have you thought about getting some upgrading, training? We try to use words that we've heard workers say to us. You thought about going back to school, so a variety of these. And you know what works in, in your community, what kind of sort of phrasing. And there's, there is a cost to not talking about literacy. That sort of came out in the key informant interviews and through our process this year is if we didn't plant seeds, if, we, if literacy wasn't, LBS wasn't included early on, even though people appeared not to be listening, what happened is we have been seeing, because we have experienced lots of layoffs in southwestern Ontario, in particular in our region, we've been seeing a lot of people, they go through their severance, then their EI, they keep thinking I'm going to get a high paying, you know, the same kind of paying job that I had at the last factory, I'm going to get that, you know, and they get disappointed. So they go through severance, EI, and then they tumble onto welfare. They're going, what happened? And sometimes they even cycle in the system, maybe not quite finding where they need to go. Um, and so that's a human cost. That's a time cost. That's lost effort. That's lost efficiency. Um, that if we could plant the seeds, even if they don't seem like they're paying attention. Um, what I always say is, you know, if you if you sort of plant some seeds, you plant 50 seeds and only two or three people take, you know, sort of sprout right away, but you don't know how many are going to sprout down the line. So, you know, plant the seeds, it's well worth it. We needed easier, quicker ways to connect laid off worker skills with the growing industries. And, it, and um, I'll give you one quick example of how we did that here, which was very helpful. When Maple Leaf Schneiders announced that they were shutting down, um, ourselves, Project READ uh, Literacy Network and um, the Workforce Planning Board of Waterloo Wellington Dufferin, we went in along with um, a representative from Training College Universities, we, the three of us went into Maple Leaf and we did sessions with workers and planted seeds. Um, and even though it was early on, they had just announced these, these, um, the, the complete shutdown of the factory, 
we had a good turnout, I would say anywhere from 15 to 30 workers at each session, and there was uh, three or four sessions. Um, and so what we did is um, the TCU would talk about adjustment services, what they can expect of sort of the adjustment process, what might be happening, you know, as far as um, their support for workers, and that there was an Employment Ontario network made up of essential, you know, employment services and literacy and basic skills and, you know, training and apprenticeship. And then um, the uh, Workforce Planning Board, they came and gave a really quick, and the whole presentation, each each part was only five to ten minutes, so the whole presentation was only about 30 minutes, so very quick, you know, here's some info. So Workforce Planning Board would come in and talk about, you know, here's the labor force sort of labor market forecast. Here's the jobs that are declining. Here's the ones that are rising. Here's how your, you know, because it was food processing, here's how you might link in. And in fact, food processing is rising in our area, so there was a good linkage. Um, then after that forecast, then we came, we got up and talked about sort of links to training, you know, um, that you could have, we called it a skills checkup. You know, it's just like going to the doctor. You can have a free skills checkup, and we, we did get a, quite a bit of uptake on those. Um, so it, it was a good sort of planting of seeds with people to say, here's your options, here's what's free, you know, think about it. And so that was a process that we used that was quite effective. Um, so some of the comments, we wanted, we noted these down because I think they were significant in many ways. Um, for example, the first one there, the laid off, we should know about literacy services right away so we can get started. Like I say, only a small minority will get started right away, but there are some people who are keeners. So why not provide that information as soon as possible, along with the employment services information. There are people that, you know, will be late adopters of information and everybody in between. Um, people with weak literacy skills may not realize they could benefit from having better skills. Sometimes people don't understand the link between here's what jobs are demanding now. It's different from when you got your job in the current factory or company that you're in. And as all of you know, so many jobs, almost every job is upskilled. In other words, the basic level of education, credentials, skills that are needed in a, a job today are much higher than they were 10, 20 years ago. And so they might not admit that it's, this is an issue because, of course, they've worked all these years and been successful. And then the support we give, the familiar face, it's very important. Um, and again, this harkens on, uh, this came from a peer helper in an action center. It harkens on the emotional aspect of lay, layoffs and shutdown. It's a very real factor that has to be taken into account when you're working in these situations. And hit the nail on the head with this top comment. It's intimidating and embarrassing to talk about literacy. So what other language can we use? We even went as far in our last uh, meeting, local meeting, to say, well, maybe you know, TCU should think about renaming literacy and basic skills. Maybe we should be essential skills. You know, even that is more acceptable than the L word. Um, and uh, this was an interesting comment, the middle one here, Action Center staff sort of, um, you know, we tried to protect them until retirement, um, but the plant ultimately closed. Um, you know, sometimes, and we've heard that not only about people close to retirement, but others where they've sort of, they kind of suspect somebody's struggling, but they don't know how to approach it. They don't want to embarrass them. You know, how do you handle that? And I think that is something that LBS agencies could help with. Or if we said, hey, Everybody's having a skills checkup. You know, everybody, do you want to just talk to somebody about, you know, school ideas? Um, we take, we've done sort of both educational interviews, which is literally sort of more of an interview-based discussion. Gee, you thought about going back to school. Do you know about these options? Or sometimes the workers picked an option and then just talked to our assessor in an educational assess in an educational interview about they can confirm that that's the most effective, efficient pathway. So it's almost pathway, it's almost like a guidance discussion. Then we've used um, specific assessment tools for our skills checkup, where we you know, come out and said, okay, here's exactly where your skills are at. And either we'll use one that is based on the essential skills um, uh, scale, so they come out with a, a level or points rating, 
or uh, we're using one that's articulated to uh, LBS and OALCI levels. Um, and another good one, our company was big on education and training, so they had invested ahead of time. That's the ideal, so people are just comfortable with the whole idea of training. Checking my time here. Oh, yes, we're doing okay. Okay, the results. So, as I said, just to, to, um, to, to uh, review, we conducted key informant interviews, we did research, we met with, um, uh, uh, we had meetings, community meetings, gathering information, and then we wrapped up, we had a community meeting, uh, we met with TCU staff as well, we wrapped up and had a final meeting on December 6th to sort of really solidify next steps. Um, I have to say that the meetings that we had with TCU were really valuable. We um, met a couple times with them to really and provided reports to them during the project to say, here's what's the understanding of the community, how can you help clarify that? Because ultimately it, it is their adjustment advisory policy, their program. Um, and so what they did is they agreed to develop a presentation uh, that was given to CELC, is Community Employment Linkages Committee. It's the Employment and Training Committee in Waterloo Region. Um, also provided to um, Guelph Wellington Employment and Training Committee. So we covered our, our particular region. And I'm going to show you that TCU presentation, in fact. Um, so it began, it helped to provide a common, clarified understanding of sort of adjustment processes from TCU's perspective. And that was invaluable. People found it really helpful. In fact, they clarified, what's the role of peer helpers? Where do peer helpers come from? Because it seemed to be inconsistent depending on the action center. What's the role of the action center chair? So having all this information sort of out on the table that everyone knew, it's going to make it easier than to have a common language and a common policy to discuss. It certainly increased awareness um, for us. And also, it increased awareness for TCU that maybe we can introduce screening and information presentation info sessions about LBS sooner in the process. Plant those seeds, like I say. Okay, so what I want to do is I'm going to show you the, um, these slides won't go out because I don't have permission to share them, but I can, I can um, certainly show them to you now. So here we go. These were the slides prepared by Adjustment Advisory uh, Program in, at our local office uh, based in Kitchener. Um, I have to say, I am not a TCU rep. I'm the, I'm the Executive Net Network Director at Project Read, so I'm going to paraphrase here. I'm not speaking for TCU, so there's my disclaimer. Um, but here you can see the process that they call rapid response. TCU are notified of a layoff. Uh, through either a Form 1, so the company contacts them basically, or they have get a media report. Within one hour, they've got to, especially with 50 or more, they have to contact the employer and start confirming details. Uh, start. They have to also inform the municipal government, mayor, you know, regional mayor, whatever, um, and then start to assess what kind of tier level are they talking about. You know, how big is this? How many will it? How will it affect the community? Um, and they also take a look at the existing capacity of the EO network. If there is enough capacity, as you can see in Tier 2, enough capacity within LBS and Employment Services, then they'll say, here's the services that exist. They'll, they'll um, put a call out to Employment Services and LBS, okay, please provide these services. You have capacity within your mandate. Um, if people are over capacity, then it becomes a different issue and they would handle it differently. Certainly in our area, our employment services have capacity, our LBS do not, they're, they're at and past capacity. Um, and of course, tier three, they're looking at all the adverse effects on the community. So they look at the existing um, network to see that uh, workers are provided with a whole menu of programs from Employment Ontario, a list of ES providers, and that there's they have the website um, information to connect. Tier one, they also uh, here's some examples of local companies that have experienced this. They um, 
uh, and usually it's been an ES, an employment services provider has gone out uh, and provided information about all EO programs. Um, we recently um, updated LBS, some generic LBS slides that we've provided to ES uh, partners to say, please put these in your presentation because uh, we weren't aware of what the LBS slides were before. Now, that was another thing. Some ES providers were aware they were supposed to talk about LBS. A lot didn't, so we've smoothed that out. Service Canada um, also provides information. Apparently, they both do it on-site for a large shutdown, but they also um, hold um, uh, info sessions at their offices for laid-off workers, so that might be from small to medium enterprises. And so we're going to approach Service Canada and say, can you include these LBS generic slides listing all the local providers in your presentation? So everybody, we're trying to get everybody to have the same information, and I mean all laid off workers. Uh, provider outreach can include, you know, on-site stuff, extended hours of operations, so workers can begin their adjustment efforts. Again, these are all slides from TCU. For large scale closures, uh, sorry, large scale closures, it's Monday, my lips aren't quite working. Um, th then there might be a specialized group uh, that would, or, or particular um, training that might be offered. Um, there's a, a company in our, in our area that, where there's about 700 people being laid off. They're looking at actually accessing TCU funds to pay for particular modularized uh, delivery of LBS services, um, uh, partly because our LBS agencies don't have capacity to provide to them, and secondarily, they have particular needs. So we're taking a look at that right now. A lot of it is GED prep. Um, there's some uh, probably looking at Employment Track Express. I don't know if people are familiar with that. That program was originally developed by the College Sector Committee. Um, it's an excellent curriculum that focuses uh, gets people working on computers, they're increasing their essential and literacy skills uh, by going through career uh, search. Um, and they try to make the Action Center a very comfortable, friendly, temporary resource center. So it doesn't replace the resource centers that employment services have in the community. What they're doing is supplementing and supplementing those and making them specific. So an employment service agency would come in and provide employment uh, support services. Um, it's staffed by a coordinator and peer helpers who are drawn from the workforce. Uh, there's positives to that because they know the workforce, they're familiar people, and the thought is that peer helpers, because they're familiar, workers may be more comfortable to approach them and talk to them about what it's like. And they also sort of can highlight or identify people that they think they might suspect are struggling a little bit or could use a helping hand or a bit more personal support. As you can see, they make referrals to a wide variety of services. Um, the peer helpers do receive training. That was something that we talked a lot to TCU about because we wanted to understand the peer helper role. We wanted to understand one of our next steps is how we're going to sort of mesh together and work with the peer helpers whether we're an ES agency or an LBS agency. So they try to get initial training in just dealing with the emotional aspect of job loss, um, how to identify possible you know, suicide and extreme stress and importance of confidentiality. They, uh, here's some of the roles of peer helpers. So all of this information was so, help, so helpful for ES and LBS to understand, you know, what are these people and what, you know, why are they drawn from the, um, from the workplace? What is that about? I'm not going to read all these. I, I think you can kind of scan them. A lot of encouragement, a lot of support. That's the key to sort of what a peer helper does. And referrals, of course, out to community agencies and to advocate uh, for their, their fellow workers. I'm just going to get out of that one and we'll go back to this presentation. Okay, so we're getting to the end here. So what are our lessons learned? That we work better together. It's as simple and as complicated as that. Um, you know, as far as looking at, you know, how does this sort of support performance measures within the Employment Ontario, <coughs> excuse me, framework? 
obviously customer satisfaction and service coordination. If LBS and ES are all present at a shutdown, at a layoff, then you know we're we're bumping up and providing services that ultimately satisfy learners, clients, you know, our our, our people in the community, and obviously the inter um, interagency referrals become important and can be counted towards service coordination, uh, because certainly there's a recognition that there's a, a reporting framework and people want to get credit for the for the work that they're doing with clients with laid off workers. Effectiveness, well as you can see, certainly laid off workers fit within the suitability um, <clears throat> criteria and then the completion of goal path uh, because usually they're headed back to an employment goal path or um, maybe post-secondary which ultimately is leading to re-employment. Um, so uh, though, you know, working with laid off workers fits into the framework we need to report on. Same with ES, the service impact. Um, hopefully we're getting them back to an employed uh, a status or on a career path or being referred to appropriate training and education. And of course they fit into the suitability um, criteria that are provided by EO. And then efficiency, learners served, um, intakes for assisted, any info sessions, they can count the number of people that were provided that attended those info sessions which might have taken place on site at the workplace or on site at the action center. So that's how they can be sort of counted and included within the performance measure framework. So people, so ES and LBS get credit for that work. Um, the other part of working together is, you know, um, uh, recognizing sort of when is it assisted and unassisted um, work. This relates to the, the previous um, slide. Um, I'm going to focus on the last three points, uh, which is, um, oh, no, I want to highlight, sorry, the third point, concurrent service. Um, absolutely, clients can provide, there was still some people who felt like it had to be um, consecutive, you know, one after the other, or they go to ES, then LBS, you know, or LBS, then ES. Absolutely, people can receive concurrent service within EOIS CAMS, so somebody can be getting the job employment counseling at the same time or other supportive services from ES the same time pursuing upgrading and that's really important to remember. <clears throat> um, literacy networks, uh, our experience with our role of providing <clears throat> initial promotion of LBS, our agencies in our particular region are very busy and can't always get to all the action centers especially as I said in the past where we had like a dozen going. So we were taking out the brochures. We were saying, here's the options. It's important to think about those referring people when we did educational interviews with workers. And giving the whole sort of broad picture to people about the LBS system. And certainly we want to provide LBS information to Service Canada, make sure that that's put in uh, <clears throat> to the info sessions that the federal uh, government provides. And of course, just working within the labor adjustment um, situation, I think we've had really good discussions with TCU and they see, not that they didn't see a role for LBS, they did, but I think it's been more clarified. And that's what's been helpful about this project. So the bottom line, you know, what are we doing from here on? Is uh, basically we, that we do have a role to play, that it can be very helpful. Um, <clears throat> Um, uh, for centralized information and routing and for uh, laid off workers as an entry point. We can provide an entry point into, into LBS. And um, the, uh, we provided PowerPoint slides to employment services, some of our partners, and now into TCU, but we're going to make sure that all ES agencies have them and Service Canada has them. A common message about the benefits of attending LBS to laid off workers. And as I said, concurrent services, mentioned that one before, and provide program information and screening tools to ES. This is our next step. We've drafted some screening tools. There's several of them, and I, and I do mean screening. Um, so it'd be a literacy and essential skills screen um, that employment services could use. Um, uh, within sort of shutdown situations, so a very brief one, it would only be indicators of some issues. So it's not a replacement of a full-blown 
literacy and essential skills uh, assessment tool, uh, which is a more thorough and in-depth identification of skill levels uh, in a wide variety. This would be an indicator. Ideally, we would like to, um, you know, not only have a paper and PDF version of this, but we'd like to get it online, and that kind of leads to what are our next steps. Um, we do hope to uh, gain a second um, round or a second stage of phase two of labor market partnership funding. I know that Literacy Link South Central, who was the lead on applying for labor market partnership funding in this year, for this year, they have taken the lead again for Western Region Networks to apply for a phase two. And so we're going to focus on hopefully developing an online screening tool that can be used by ES or other partners. And then last but not least, we want to provide, we, uh, um, TCU suggested that we provide info sessions to peer helpers somewhere in their training um, or, you know, whether that's in the very initial stages or, you know, sort of maybe halfway during the, the shutdown process. And to ES staff, we would like to provide those workshops in the coming year. And of course, continue to provide info sessions to laid off workers about returning to school, upgrading, whatever phrase works in your community, whatever you use. We tend to use returning to school, upgrading, and accessing training. That's, that's words that our workers in our area are comfortable with. So um, we've um, included, we've proposed to continue to visit action centers in our region and our bu annual business plan. We've priced that out, um, and if we provide to any additional ones, then that'll be an extra, an extra fee. So um, that's so. Just to sum up, we, you know, it, 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 we came, we investigated, we talked to a lot of people, we came to some common understandings, we addressed sort of the the gaps in knowledge by getting more information out there. We took a look at, we also listened to our EO partners and said, what do you want? And they said they want a literacy screen. They said they want more training for their frontline, you know, workers about, you know, especially in employment services, what's LBS all about? How do we approach that in a sensitive manner? So that's where we're headed. That seemed to be what people want. And um, so we'll continue to work in partnership, not only with our EO partners, but with TCU to help workers. Because ultimately, that's what we kept in mind, that if we're here to help workers, then we need to know how to extend information to them that's biteable, that plants seeds when they are open to hearing them. And hopefully, at some point, when they're emotionally ready, um, you know, it never hurts to plant a seed. They may, as many of you know, sometimes it takes somebody several times before they come in an LBS door. So you never know when that first, when that seed will germinate. So uh, I see that we're just at about quarter to 11. So if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take those.